Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to start the third day of the seminar, and uh, I've made mention before in the previous few days to Marcus's slickness of organising for the seminar, and I'd like to further congratulate him on the $25 price rise in the price of gold last night, which he organised. Our first speaker up this morning is a sartorially splendid fellow oh, yes. who I've known for a little over two years now. We met in the Sombate in Hungary in August of 2007. Subsequent to that with his charming and lovely wife Martha, we met up in uh, Australia at the first seminar, then we met up in Vienna, then we met again in San Francisco, all the time eating our way through the best restaurants in town. <laughs> and, uh, so to catch up with him again on this trip in Canberra is just fantastic. He's a lovely guy, he's got a very he has very eclectic tastes, you know, he's sort of been into this, he's a philosopher and he's a writer and uh, he's all sorts of things. He's got a legal background, but um, he is also, amongst all those other things, he is a devotee of Professor Antel E. Paquette, a very keen student of many years and a very good friend of the professor and his wife Judith. And um, I think that's about all I need to say. I'd like to introduce the one and only Daryl Robert Schumer. You get that kind of introduction when you write it out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Um, I'm going to talk about money, and that's what we have been talking about here. And I'll be in a different way. And so my approach is. You know, we've all heard, well, what is money? Money can be anything. Money has been many things. Money's been salt, cattle, um, you know, seashells, uh, the tally stick in early England, many, many different things. So to approach the subject, I have the idea, let's, since money can be anything, let's just take something hypothetical and run it through a real-time process and see how it shakes out in that thing. So, as part of our hypothetical, let's say Martha and I decided uh, to sell our property in the United States and move somewhere else, okay? So we have something to sell. And we list our property, all right? We get a phone call. And um, somebody says, okay, I, I like your property. It's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to buy it. Sure, that's what, that's what the offer's for. All right, so we said, well, how much? And he said, well, I'm not sure um, how many toenails. <laughs> Toenails. And I said, well, okay. Uh, depends whose toenail it is. It's because when you're dealing in toenails, that's really what the issue is. Because not all toenails are the same. All right? That's like money. Uh, oh, this toenail is from Jesus Christ. <laughs> we knew it was fraud. We did, our place wasn't worth that much. <laughs> say, oh, yeah, well, even a little bit of the smallest toe, of the last toenail of Jesus Christ, it would be in a museum somewhere, it would be in a state trust, it would be the part of a city group's asset base. <laughs> Certainly not being offered for Martha and I's, you know, piece of property and, and whatever else we have. So we knew it was a fraud, all right? But that's what happens when you are using a toenail-based system for money. And there would be many virtues to it. I thought about this. Many virtues. It's like the amount of toenails would grow with the population. <laughs> and so the growth of the toenail of your asset base, of the money base in society, wouldn't would, would be tied something to a species as Milton Friedman's 3% rule, where you come up with 3%. They would be organically tied to the growth of your population. All right? And there would be a natural retirement of, of value. Because what happens is, is that value would be attached to the toenail who it came from, all right? George Washington would be, I mean, be a very valuable piece of toenail in the United States, more than Aaron Burr, all right? More than, and then some people like Michael Jackson, he'd have a toenail value too, all right? Which would value, which would fluctuate madly. Right? There would probably be a futures market by Michael Jackson toenail, and if you would buy, when he was suspected of being a molester, you would have bought a lot of <laughs> And sold when he died, you would have made a fortune. You would have made a fortune. Okay? So this is, this is what would happen if you used a toenail-based commodity back then. All right? So let's say Martha and I found a, uh, a suitable offer, one we knew that was right, and, and of course they'd have uh, title insurance coverage. In this, in this thing, uh, guarantees of, of the 
not of our property. They, they'd have to be that we'd have to clear title of the property. But in fact, that this was a bit of a toenail of so and so and so and so and so. Okay. But, but let's say we wanted to go and visit uh, our friend Mr. Song in Hong Kong. Right. The toenails that we have are American, <laughs> and the values attached to those toenails are extant in America, not so much in Hong Kong. All right. A toenail of Jesus Christ, where is it? Where it would be virtually priceless, and would in the Hong Kong people would not be worth a lot. Right? But over there, perhaps the, to the toenail of Gautama Buddha would be worth more. All right. So you have this variation in value. All right. So to go over there, there'd be probably a live market. All right. And maybe there's a thing, but what would happen really is that you would probably have an intermediary. All right. That we both trusted. All right, and we, so between these various toenail uh, currency sectors, you would have a intermediary uh, trade going on to balance things like that. Like that right? And lo and behold, it would probably be gold. Because the Hong Kong people trusted gold as value, and they didn't necessarily trust the toenails of Michael Jackson, but they did trust gold. We may know in America that Gautama Buddha was a great man, but it wouldn't be valued as highly, all right, in the United States. So what would happen is, is that gold would perform that function. It was a thing that everybody trusted. Now the truth of the matter is, we don't deal with toenails. Toenails never, I don't think they ever were a thing of value, all right, but, but um, gold is. Throughout history, gold has been money, all right? It's it just been money. And, and it's instinctual as much as anything else. You could, in Rudy's um, uh, example of the island you know, with a few people, they knew each other, right? They knew they, knew they needed fish and berries and whatever, and, 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 and trade happened, you know, commerce, okay? And what happened according to what they knew, what they valued and stuff like that, it was, it, it was mutual, it was, it was beneficial. But when it gets bigger, when you move this, the complexity, the level of complexity, you need something that is not so locus-based for value, all right? My, my metaphor, I use toenails, all right? But anything, all right? U.S. dollar, all right? You want, the yen, all right? You need something that's understand. That's why when we come here, we have to translate it into your Australian dollars, all right? And, Martha, I keep cans of these things because you travel so much, you know. Right? And and you know we, I said, oh, we made out on this, <laughs> you know. We didn't make out on that, you know. But it doesn't matter. You just have to use it for use it, you know. And you use one. But what happened is, is that in the in the in the days of early trade, when the world was much more fragmented than it is now, when our understanding of the rest of the world was a was rumored. Pure rumor, all right, that other people were on this planet with us and were different than us in very fundamental ways. We didn't even know of them, all right. So the people who transited, who made the, the flow from one to the other, were traders, all right. And the, and the major trade was the, tr the the flow from the east to the west, the west to the east, all right. And what happened is, is that those who traded, they would take their you know, their, 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 their expeditions and they'd load them up with the goods of one place and take them to the goods of another place and trade them and sell them. Blah, blah, blah. And what they would deal in is, of course, gold or silver. Because it was accepted everywhere along the way. No matter what the language, no matter what their custom, no matter what the religion. They didn't have to go and explain it to a person. Why is this toenail really valuable? All right? I was a great man. Silver. That was gold. Your only question was, was it real? Mm -hmm. All right, haven't been diluted, I haven't been mixed. All right, but other than that, it was accepted without question. All right. Now, what happened is this is just generally the way it was until time is an amazing thing. It's like there's a symmetry to time. All right, if you stand back far enough. One thousand years ago, something really different happened to money that had never happened before. And it happened because of two inventions. And the inventions were the invention of paper and the invention of ink. <laughs> I think you see where I'm going. Okay. And 
Without paper and ink, you couldn't come up with paper money. But the reason paper and ink got translated into paper money was because of another factor, which I want to put up here. And this factor is probably the most important factor in economics. I call it H and P. It's not the virus that we're having. <laughs> Human nature. Uh, Human nature combined with paper and ink. All right. The interesting thing about it is that paper money first arose in China, but it didn't arise as, in, as a money conveyance first. It didn't arise as what we call money. They called it flying money. And it arose between the trading houses in China. All right? There were people who facilitated trade, they were like bankers or whatever, and they, they, they had bills and blah, 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 they facilitated commerce. And, and, and to keep and to transport money, I don't know what they used, copper, the heavy ingots or something, you know, something like that. It wasn't gold and silver at that time. Uh, they had it, but they, it wasn't the common currency. Uh, they would use these pieces of paper because they trusted each other. You know, Mr. HXQ and Shengdong, you know, Mamoru, I don't know. Good. Okay. Trust, trust, trust. Basically, right? Well, what happened is, is that somebody goes, wow, it's amazing. This is a good idea. Let's take it a little further. And it was in China that money, paper money, first became used to replace gold and silver or metals or any you know, real commodity place in the And the first attempt, everybody was happy, you know. And they said this was backed by gold and silver. It was it was backed. It was a it was a back. They just said, you just can't go out and start handing people pieces of paper and say, listen, here's a piece of paper, give me that, uh, your car. <laughs> no, 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 you wouldn't do it. And you would it. All right? So they knew that these pieces of paper represented precious metals. All right? But what happened is, let's go back to H and 1. All right? Over time, once they figured out it worked, <laughs> You know? And the rest of the people working, buying stuff, they didn't notice it. They didn't notice it. Until it crossed a line. Alright? And it was a line that no one had ever crossed before. This was the first time paper money crossed that line. And all of a sudden, inflation started to happen. What the hell is going on? Like this? And they didn't even necessarily know that it had to do with the excess of printing the paper money. All they knew is that all of a sudden the price was going up, instability, economic stability, places started going crazy, and last of got worse and worse and worse, and they printed more and more money as the, the, the government was losing control, and then it collapsed. Collapsed! Alright? So, 100 years went by, alright? Things were stable, they went back to gold and silver, whatever they had. Mainly silver was used in China, gold was kept by them. And they did it again. Same thing. Another dynasty falls because of it. All right? Corrupted the money, corrupted the dynasty, power, base fell. Right? And this was going over on another side of the world that the West had no idea even existed. It was like out there. It's like how we think of Pluto. All right? I mean, we know Pluto's not where we think it's out there. We have no idea what's going on. They could be having a rocket time. And we don't know it. I'm a dead planet. You know, that's an original planet. But what happened is, is that the news of this came back to China, to the West. And it came back to the West in around the 13th century uh, via a, a trading family named the Polos. All right? And they had gone to China, to the court of Kublai Khan, and they were sent there by the Catholics, by the Pope of Pope, 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 Italy. And they want to convert everybody to Catholicism. All right? Increases your database, your the power base. And they end up in this place that's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And they stayed there a number of years and came back. And they brought back with them. And the story of what happened would never have been written had not a war been fought between Genoa and Venice. Because the Poles were a Venetian trading set. And they got in a fight with the, with the Genoa, you know, on the other side, Genoa. And Marco Polo was captured. And he was pretty much older right now. And he was sitting in his cell, got nothing to do. And he starts swapping stories. 
And his cellmate was stunned. He was telling him about this place he'd gone to and what had happened over there. The guy says, you know, what a way to kill time. You know? I mean, what a way to kill time. That's We can sell this thing, you know? People are interested in it. It got published. Two things in that story, people were just beyond the gradient of people understand. Two things in that story were this. One of them, he, Marco Polo said in Cathay, in the kingdom of China, they burn black rocks for heat. They burn black rock. Right? I mean, in, in, in Europe, they cut down trees and dry it out and burn it. You can't take a rock and burn it. Stuff doesn't like. This one's crazy. That was the first time the Westerner coal. Chinese still burn coal. Spooned up the air. They've been time over there. They've been burning it for a long time. But the other thing that the people didn't didn't just accept, they couldn't believe, was when Marco Polo said, the great Khan takes the bark of trees and causes it to become muddy with his writing thereon. Ah, I mean, that's absurd. That was truly ridiculous. All right? And it probably did more to erode Marco Polo's credibility than anything else. But we know it's true. Now, then they do. What was going on in China for the next few centuries? Would you have these? The other thing that I like to tell you is very interesting about what Marco Polo noticed about China was that um, the only script in China was these cons piece of paper money. If you didn't, legal tender, this is real legal tender, if you didn't accept the cons paper money in, this, in, in the extinguishment of a debt, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's how you get things done. <laughs> you know, none of this pussyfooting around. Debt! <laughs> All right? Woo! Here, here. Yeah. Great, great. Spread like wow. Alright? And what Marco Polo noticed though, while his paper was the only legal tender allowed in the kingdom, the great Khan's treasury was filled with gold and silver. Mm -hmm. If you brought in goods to China, you had to go see it. Is that And if you sold goods in China, you had to give gold and silver. And take paper in return. When Marco Polo returned to Venice with his camels or whatever they had, I assume they were camels, they were loaded with gifts from the great Khan to the Pope. Who he, now, Khan never knew the Pope existed. He was probably told stories of this guy over there, blah, blah, blah. Khan didn't give a shit, you know? Good story. <laughs> so he, you know, but he's supposed to be powerful. You know, he's, it's a place way over there, a powerful guy. You know, a powerful guy should, you know, hey, powerful guy, I'm powerful too, maybe we can do something. <laughs> I don't know. Then you go, you're there. So he sent his gifts to, you know, to get, get out of favor with this guy he'd never even heard of before, before this guy shows up, you know. And he, in his graciousness and his generosity, he sent him back with those pieces of paper with writing on it. <laughs> Marco Polo shows up at the Vatican. I don't know what they call it then. But his camels load these pieces of paper <laughs> and gives it to the Jesuits, Franciscans, Benedictines. Look at this. Look at this. And so, what is this? Oh, this is money. Please. It's a gift. You can buy you a gift. It's a gift. And he sat there and thought about the learned men that came. And they decided, they, after a great deal of thought, they decided this was the work of the devil. <laughs> and they burned it. Which is probably what we should do now. <laughs> but this is what happened in the 13th century. All right. So China had various bouts of paper money throughout the next couple hundred years. Because paper money, like a virus, never really goes away. Or it hasn't yet. HN, human nature. Goes along, somebody comes up, somebody gets in a, you know, position or some things they can get somewhere with it and they did it again and it collapses again. So the country that first had used the paper money was China. And by the 1600s, our time, 
which is, well, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 years in their history. They got tired. This is real good stuff, right? And they have a lot of Okay, they have a lot of China passes a law. No more paper money. Symmetry of history is wonderful. In the West, in 1694, <laughs> the Bank of England, the Bank of England, goes to King William, who is in trouble, because he owes all this money. You know, he was from, but William of Orange, wasn't he from, uh, you know, the Netherlands, of jerks of house of hell, whatever it was, you know, they were fighting the Catholics and the Protestants, and they're, everyone's fighting for each other in Europe, marrying each other's sisters and stuff, and just trying to get land, and, so, and it all cost money, and it all came off the backs of the peasants, all right? And he was heavily in debt, and the bankers knew it. The bankers, all right? The bankers. So they cut a deal you could not refuse. And their experiment lasted a lot longer than any of the experiments <laughs> with paper money in the East. And it was very different. And I'd like to go through that with you today. What gave it layers? Right? What was the difference? <laughs> and what they did was this. They, the deal it was, it was cut between power and money. Power and money. Right? And the money boys went to the power guy and said, listen, you let us issue the coin of the realm, pay the money, and we will let you borrow indefinitely. If you're indebted, that's a great deal. All right? Couldn't refuse it. And so we did. 1694, the Bank of England was chartered, and they went into the business of. Now, the English are quite an enterprising lot. You guys have ended up halfway around the world. Look what you guys got going here. Not bad. And so they started themselves. I mean, they can get paper, they do game. Well, they immediately started hanging these people up around England, around London, all right? And they little note to this guy started printing money himself. Stop counterfeiting his tracks, all right? So, but they, you know, they, 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 they didn't, as, as, like Antal pointed out uh, the other day, they didn't stop the flow of coinage. They let coins still circulate, all right? It was a stepwise process. They weren't going to, they didn't know how far they could take it. All right? And they knew all of a sudden people would go, no, this money is nothing. They said, listen, this money is backed by silver. Okay? Colton did not. Back. It's good as that. The people were a little suspicious at first. And then there's some convenience to go. All right? And it got it caught on. All right? So the English started doing this thing. But that wasn't the real secret. That was just what they did physically. The real secret was this. We talk about money. We talk about what happened. I'm going to tell you something. <coughs> the money in England at that time was two, two types. No, there was only one type of money, even after that happened. The only money in that time, under my definition, was the coinage. But the pieces of paper they were giving you wasn't money at all. It was counterfeit. It passed as money. It passed as a conveyance. But what it really was, it's like, I don't know if you're familiar with the synapse. That's a neural connection that happens. It's boom, you know, it's like a set of calling hits and you take one thought and jumps to another. All right? That's what paper money really is. It's not money at all. What it was, was a device whereby the bankers could trap you into debt. What was their big on the deal? What did they get out of the deal? They made their money by charging interest. All right? Charging interest. And they used to make money charging interest on the loaning of other people's gold. Not bad, huh? But if you could charge interest on loaning paper money, it was even better. And this was their great thing for All right? So all the money issued out of the Bank of England was in a form of debt. It is as absolutely true today as it was then that if every one of those notes got retired, if every obligation point out, money would, quote, disappear. Which means it isn't money in the first place. 
It isn't money in the first place. It occupies that space for a short period of time to track you. To track you. All right? On this planet, on the Earth, you need to get from, you need food, you need all these things. And that's why money is valued, that's why people save it. And these people were able to get into this little kingdom by this and create this device. Charging interest on pieces of paper is extraordinary. We know that the conversion of base metals into gold is impossibility. But why even try to convert paper into gold? That's even better. And they did it. But these were not stupid people. Not at all. They're clever people. Not stupid. So what they did is they let the coin each big thing go. And, and it was really funny. Uh, the professor said something yesterday, and, and, and it, it triggered something in my mind. He was talking about how um, Germany and, and France uh, went to uh, made you know paper the, the currency of the realm legal tender, and, and and they withdrew coinage from circulation from the, the people. And so the people didn't have coins, right? But the government still did. Only in the United States were citizens disallowed from owning gold, and the reason why we were prohibited from owning gold in the United States is that it had a crisis, an economic crisis. All right? And in an economic crisis, people take their paper and they run to something more stable, which is gold. All right? They didn't want that. There was an economic crisis going on. So as soon as Roosevelt took power, probably because of the advice of Bernard Baruch, they outlawed the physical possession of gold, forcing Americans to go to government bonds for savings. All right? That's what they did. They cut them off from the past. All right? So what happened is, is that by cutting off the circulation, it finally dawned on me yesterday, because I've been listening to the professor for some time now. And look, some things don't make sense to me. And pardon me, some of them because I'm not smart enough, two, I didn't get it. And yesterday I got it. That when he pointed out that they pulled the coinage from general circulation, the common people had no alternative. They were the victims of those in power. Gold was still used in the monetary system between governments and banks. They started this as a collusion between those two power centers. And as time went on, they pulled, because it became more precious, because they are printing more money, they had to go to war. They decided, we can't get gold out all the way, but let's pull it out from the rest of the folks. And they did. All right? They did. So this is really what happened. When they, in, in 1792, when they did this, I mean 16, 1694, this is the what, 16th century, this is the 16th century, China, out, I might as well just write hieroglyphics, outlaws, <laughs> paper, all right? England, the West, all right. Uses it. Uses it. All right. For the first time. All right. This is 16th century. All right. What happened in the next hundred years? People started looking at this. Wow, this is working, and it really did work. Why? Because the basis of of the new credit debt system was credit, which turned into debt, and it coincided with the industrial revolution which grew up out of England. And the Industrial Revolution was a tremendous leap forward in humanity. All right? We had machines being able to do the work of thousands of people before. Greater efficiencies, greater productivity, blah, 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 blah. So they created a system, and the credit system, base system, not money system, let's call credit debt system, of England was aptly suited to this expansion. Expansion. Now let me tell you something about capitalism. Capitalism, I care a lot about it. And you notice I've gotten a lot of flack from some people about my attitude about capitalism. I said, why are you talking these things about capitalism? And I do it because there's a misunderstanding about what capitalism is. All right? Capitalism never even appeared on the planet before England's paper based credit debt. It didn't even exist as a word. All right? And the thing about credit and debt systems is. 
one unit of credit translates into a mountain of debt unless it's retired because it compounds. The money they give you, quote money, doesn't compound. The debt that it turns into compounds. And this is how they they sleep and you owe more to next time. Not a bad way to make a living. If that was afforded to me, I'd be wearing this for sure. <laughs> that's a wonderful way to make a living. I loan you something that's not even mine. I risk somebody else's assets and I get the cream. Not a bad way to make a living. Right? People come in for a loan, they had sex, they need So I sit there. <coughs> and I look at man, the guy, he's got this idea, he's going to launch this adventure, you know. He's got this idea, he's going to build a thing called a car. <coughs> and he shows me his piece of paper. <coughs> and I sit there, shit, this guy's nervous as hell. All right? That's power. That's power. And it's also power when he defaults in his debt and I take his house. And I take everything he put up as collateral for me loaning him pieces of paper that I was allowed to print because of my little deal with the government. <laughs> All right? Wonderful. The thing about this system is this. The compounding debt is the Achilles heels of capitalism. Because you need to expand in order to pay off that debt. It drives it. The higher the interest, the more the driver, the more debt out there. It's driven. It's a devil's whip. All right? Well, England was, I don't think any of this is anybody's fault. All right? It is. It's just, it's history. We're watching history. We're all part of history. This is something that happened before, but this is something we're, paying, we're watching this happen. So I'm just explaining to you why we're in the position that we are. So England had the Industrial Revolution. Great credit expansion. A lot of the debts got paid off. Everybody made money. Some people went broke. And the bankers just kept making more and more money as it went along. All right? And this fueled England's empire. Hadn't had an empire around since Rome. All right? But this little island sitting up there, all right? granted, English soccer fans can get real violent when they get mad. All right? <laughs> and you put them in a sailor's uniform and send them off to go to some land and get some stuff. Real good. But everybody's got violent people. You know? Everybody's got nasty people. You know? And you would think they defend themselves when these, you know, guys come around with their cannons and their navies. The difference and the reason why English established dominion over the entire known world at the time, virtual dominion, was because of credit. They were the only people who that could just go to the banks, raise that money, and just go and knock over the next country. Not going to the next century, not going to the next century. All right? So the next century, it's the 17th century. All right? 1700s, 18th century, England's dominion. All right? And people began looking at this thing. Wow, what is this amazing thing that is happening? All right? And this is where Adam Smith came in. All right? Because he noticed this great expansion. He's, he's a very, very good thinker, deep thinker. And he started making connections and things like that. And this is when they still had real bills. And the real bills had established, as the professor told us before in another session, it first arose naturally in the city-states of Italy to, to deal with debt obligations. It was a natural thing. It facilitated real trade. It made it easy, all right? It reached its epoch in industrial England when, when commerce was just churning up a store. All right? It allowed the expansion in place of credit, in place of credit, which brings debt cutting to the banks. This cut out the bankers, this cut out credit. This allowed the people who produced to consume as an internal cycle with no bid, no mafia. All right? So Adam Smith saw it, wrote The Wealth of Nations, because it was a wealth of nations. Ricardo looked at it a little later, made a mistake, as the professor pointed out, but this is all new. This is all new, so we're making assumptions a lot of stuff like that. Alright? This is the 1700s. Alright? And England's empire grew, grew, grew. Well, what happened is, people, some people weren't happy. Alright? Some people weren't happy. The rest of the world 
didn't say, oh God, look, the British are coming, the British are coming, the Magna Carta, individual rights, <laughs> oh, this is wonderful, bespoke tailoring, tea and four, <laughs> you know, porcelain, you know, you get those cute little accents. No, they didn't say that. Holy shit, these guys are coming and things over here, okay? And they didn't have credit based things to raise an army, they couldn't get together, they were industrialized. So they're going down like, all right, all right. Well, two countries stopped, stopped it. It was China and it was Russia. Feudal giants sleeping, sleeping, all right. And when the Ma of England approached, they did not let them in. Well, there was a certain recognition that it was England's economy that was the basis of their power. So there was a guy named Marx sitting over there drinking shops. And they started asking questions. And he started coming up with answers. That's what people do. You ask them a question, they come up with an answer. And he was a clever fellow. He visual. They we found this whole other thing. But it was a textbook. It was like a theory. It was like a theory like Keynes. Thing, I'm just saying it was a theory. Or Milton Friedman's 3% increase in the year, or let currencies float. You know? I mean, you let currencies float, it sounds like an idea until you realize currencies can sink as well as float. All right? But it was a theory that was going around at the time, had never been practiced, and so Russia and China, the intelligent, intelligentsia, took this thing that opposed England's advance and installed it in their countries. A dysfunctional economy that had never been tried, never been worked, and stuck in their economies. But it wasn't even so much the economic system that was terrible. What they did was they, because the threat of England was so deep, coming on, they combined all the power centers into one. They combined economic, civil, financial into one. And you give people power, you give them power. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what race they are, this thing is going to get you in China. You went in China. And it did. One of the virtues of the American experiment, and it was an experiment, because it's fake. It is fake. It was an experiment in limited government. It was the only government that was formed by rebels who took up, threw out government, and said, how can we keep this thing all right? Well, let's break down power. Let's put the judiciary over there. Let's put the, the, the legislatures over here. Let's put this over there. And you know what? If you want something done, that's really inefficient. It's hard to get things done when you got to kind of deal with this kind of thing. So it took around 100 years before they got rid of the inefficiencies. All right? Oh, we roll now. We roll. And that vision that they had of free and independent people and economy is gone. The experiment is failed. And we are here at the end. And that's what's happening, all right? What really has happened is that we've come full circle. We are now a thousand years later after the English experiment ended, I mean started. There's a certain symmetry of time that's really wonderful. A thousand years have gone by. And we're at a, at a critical point, at an incredible point. It's been less than 10 years. Do you realize that 10 years ago, the dot-com bubble was rolling. I mean, maybe you should put some of that gold process. It's hot so far. All right, look at this. All right, but the truth of the matter is, it's all a bubble. Once you can get away with printing paper money and controlling debt and credit, you can do a lot of things with it. But once you start dismantling the controls of the system. And Professor Fekete said it eloquently. It's the break on the engine of credit. The break on the engine of credit. All right? And what it's the break on is this. It's the break on government. Okay? It's the break. Because what once you've got to do, and put yourself in the banker's position, how do you maintain power? You give money away, you're printing that stuff. Huh? Everybody needs money, even rich people. The critical power in any society today is credit. And if you're hanging on credit, you are, quote, the kingmaker. 
All right? So what happened was this, and I'd like to dispel a few notions about politics and power and stuff like that. It is believed, and it's this, this story is being passed around, that's the liberal side that is destroying this great experiment. Right? It's great thing. It's the welfare state. I know we have a welfare state. I know it's not a But it didn't start with that. It started with the warfare state. 1694. It was war that caused the war. Professor Anne Fecte spoke to us yesterday about the 100 year anniversary, 1909. A legal tender was made to law so England and Germany could take on the laws and go each other. All right? The dismemberment of the greatest hoard in monetary gold in history happened between 1949 and 1971. The United States had 21,775 tons of gold. Croce just didn't have that much gold. We didn't go off the gold standard in 1971 because of social programs. By that time, the U.S. citizens couldn't allow gold. Gold moved only between nations to settle deficits. Between 1949 and 1971, the United States had a positive trade balance with the rest of the world. We were a shit. We made it everything, and we made it better, and we made it cheaper, and we sold it everywhere. If we had 21,775 tons of gold in 1949, we should have had 25,000, 30,000 tons of gold by 1970. When Nixon shut the gold window, we had 78,000 tons left, and we owed 32,000 tons more. And we had a positive balance of trade during that time. Well, where did the gold go, you might ask? No, it seems to. <laughs> the gold went because of huge international bills from two sources, mainly from the global presence in the U.S. military, we were on a war footing, on a war footing, all right? And the expansion of U.S. corporate ex overseas. All that took, people went, they got pieces of paper, American toenails, traded for gold at the window, we fessed up, all right? We spent so much, we bankrupted ourselves in the pursuit of power when we were already the most powerful nation in the world. Power is insatiable. You can never have enough, but you can never have enough money. It can. Human nature. That's what we're up against. This is what we're up against. You can have the best system in the world. It's going to corrupt. All right? It's a sad truth. So that's what we're going to have. And here we are. They've taken the break off. It's spun out of control. There's more debt than ever be paid back. Americans are walking away from those. You know what Thomas Jefferson said? That's terrible. Yeah, it's horrible. I'm an American. I was born in Washington, D.C. I watched this happen. All right? And, and, and you know what politics is like? Politics is like being at a bar and saying, you know, they, they should trade for this guy. You know, and, and our team will be a lot better. You know, they, you know, he's, he's, they, you know, they should get different players. Get another general manager. Well, they're doing good. Nobody cares what you think. It doesn't matter. You know, I thought of saying today, how many people vote? How many people watch porn? <laughs> It might be the same damn thing. <laughs> the same damn thing. Politicians are the pole dancers of power. <laughs> All right? And each side has got some great lights. <laughs> Remember Ronald Reagan? Oh, man, he saved capitalism. Came in 1980 on a balanced budget. The United States owed $1 trillion after 200 years in business, in existence. When he left office, we owed three and a half trillion. We weren't even at war. We didn't have a financial crisis. And all the conservatives, our boy, run. <laughs> Why? Because he told you what you wanted to hear. That's what you're doing. And the Democrats, oh, Bill. Thank God I saw that bitch. The bush is on him. Oh, God, Bill. Save us from these sons. They're ruining us. Bill walks in. That's a deal. Golden sex. No. It's Robert Rubin. No. Oh. Larry Summers. Right? It's a funny thing about this. The Great Depression was a terrible thing. Happened mainly in the United States. These nice things did it. And they passed one law, 1933, called the Last Legal Act. <clears throat> one damn law. And they said to prevent this horrible catastrophe from happening again. 
we're going to draw a line on this. We're not going to allow investment banks to get the savings of commercial banks. We're not going to allow the betters and the boys, the putters at the table, to take the hard-earned savings. Widows and orphans and entrepreneurs and business people who risk their lives and hours and their wages and their savings for another day and bend to the table and lose like that for the British. One law. That law lasted until 1999. When Bill Clinton signed the mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. but let me tell you, it was a bipartisan effort. <laughs> it was a bipartisan effort. The Republicans were already on board. And if you want to win a war, buy off the enemy. You want to know why Goldman Sachs is so powerful? They ain't no smarter than the boys at J.P. Morgan Chase, Bear Stearns, Lehman's. They're not smarter. They're all smart. They all learned how to play the money. What happened was they bought off the Democrats. That's how you make money. That's how you win. You buy off the enemy. And then you're home free. Heading at the state side of the table. And they did that. 1999, Bill Clinton repeals Glass Steel. They could bet the savings of Americans once again. Alright? Oh, the lovers of deregulation. The lovers of deregulation. Human nature. I tell you, I hate government regulation. I hate it more than most people this morning. <laughs> Alright? I tell you. You do this. Put it in the hands of someone with more power than me. He's not going to do me any good. All right? First we born, 1998. That little thing came up. Regulation of financial business. CTF. CTF. Wow, regulation. She looked at this and said, you know what? I've got to regulate this. We've got to put it under the Regulation of Futures Commission. Stuff is dangerous. You know, it's like a and so she said, this is what we should do. She got a phone call. Arthur Levitt, oh, great guy. Yeah, this is not a bad guy. Al Greenspan, Bob Lee. He's a guy. All right? But if you read about the story of Brooks and Bond, you know what he's saying? Oh, Brooks Lee had the wrong attitude. She was litigious. She was adversarial. That's why we didn't regulate derivatives. The one lone voice. And Larry Summers, that son of a bitch, called up and said, if you regulate this, we're going to have a financial catastrophe. Larry Summers, President Obama's chief economic advisor. The same man fired from Harvard for saying men were smarter than women. And while his vice president of the World Bank, under his office was issued a paper suggesting that polluting industries should be moved from industrialized countries to third world countries where the cost is low, the human cost. Wake up. This is what we call lands. This is what we're in. This is what they created. This is why you're in trouble. It's not by accident. It's by design. They didn't expect what's happening, but they designed it in the beginning. It was embedded. It merely took time to reveal itself. All right? It merely took time to reveal itself. And it has, and here we are. And my only thought is, it's 2009. We're very close to the cliff. We're very close to the cliff. And we're going to go over. We, we, we might not. I mean, I, I've been wrong in the past. All right? Been, oh. Alive long enough to know that. But my feeling is we are going to go over that cliff. And and there's a great fear of us going over that cliff. But in a sense, I've got another fear. That it is going to strip away the artifice, the greed, the horribleness that's embedded in the system. Most of us, and this is the way human nature is, even though we're not running, we're in it. As long as we're doing all right. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's got trouble, somebody's got a problem, that's theirs. And as long as you're doing it right, you probably lay it off to a cult, to a character defect. They don't work hard enough. They don't take enough risk. They're not clever enough. Or 
maybe their husband died. I left them with two kids with the basket. And there's no sinking fine. Snake, snake, and so are we. But I believe that history is a very long thing. And we all, we go through growth and we go through deaths. And, and, and uh, we are on the verge of the end of this extraordinary system. It is extraordinary. I've had a lot of fun here. And, but we're on the verge of where the system is ending. And I don't know if it's going to be better. I don't know if it's going to be worse. I know it's going to be different. And if you look at history, it's always generally been better. That's, there was this extraordinary book written by David Hackett Fisher. And he talked about the shifts in Western history, how the feudal age was succeeded by the Renaissance. The Renaissance was succeeded by the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was succeeded by British imperial, you know, British bankers. And it did bring the world together. It really did. This world is very different. And so it served its purpose. And now that its purpose has been served, it's just been on the table. Anything on the table. And we can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about that more than we can about the deal cut between King and Lord. It's done. It's out of our hands. What we can do is be aware. What we can do is watch this and see who's at the table. Don't expect the people benefiting from the system to change it. It's benefiting them. All right? Don't expect change to come from them. All right? But change is going to be forced in them, as it is generally on all of us. Individuals, countries, we respond to pressure. All right? And the more entrenched we are in established whatever it is, the harder it is for us to let it go. We don't like them to go in. All right? I was talking with a lady in Auckland. It was wonderful. We were talking about change. She, she had the, 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 the cleaners, the corn, and I got into a dinner with the professor. It was the last month I had before and I needed the shirt cleaner before I came back to Auckland. And so I walked in the cleaners down the corner, I'm talking to this lady. And it, I don't know how I got. She said, I'm afraid of change. I hate change. I said, I understand. I hate change. She said, I have a respect for it. I'm not interested in the emotion. Crap, right? So we got pretty intimate on a shirt, all right, over a short period of time. And I don't know how we got from there to economics, but we did. <laughs> 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 in a Friday afternoon, we got into talking about the depression. And I brought up that little thing about glass steel. <laughs> the only thing that changed between 1933 and now was glass steel on that startup. She says, no, 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 something else changed. She says, yes. The buildings are sealed. They can't jump out. <laughs> she says, because they're all air conditioned. And they're sealed. I could not with the lady. I never thought of it. And she was right. She was probably more right than my tiny nigga in the collapse of the economy and the repeal of the past deal. And I believe I'm right. <laughs> so, we never know what's going to happen. We never know what's going to come. <laughs> and I am a fundamentalist in a very, very deep sense. I believe fundamentally in life. That's what attracted me to the professor's thoughts. Not only was he subversed in things far more than I was, but there's a lot of people versed in economics and theory and stuff like that. But it's his humanity. He cared about the widows and orphans. He cared about the savers. He cared about people. And those who don't care about it, when they get their way, the weakest fall first. I live in the United States. I live in the United States. And the weakest are more vulnerable than anywhere else right now. And they're going to pay a price. They're going to pay a price. But everyone's going to pay a price. Everyone's going to win. But that's what attracted me to the thoughts and beliefs of the professor. It's humanity. I don't know what's going to come out of this. But the reason why Mark and I have put the website, Mark did the website, not me. But the reason why we have supported him so much is why. It's because his voice needed to be heard. I, I thought, my God, there's only one man who knows these things. You know, it's like, <coughs> you're sitting there and everybody's got, you know, candles. And this guy is the only guy who knows how to make incandescent lamps. You know? And you're holy shit. <laughs> it go dark real quick. And so we met, there's only a few of us, and Philip was there, rolled in from Australia. 
Like, we had some feelings about the street. <laughs> Martha had an Australian boyfriend. And uh, our crocodile then did, you know. <laughs> we didn't know much about it. We had some feelings. And uh, Philip comes in. We had first meeting, but we all met in Zombie Tech. All right? Very interesting time. Just like today. When we met, the credit crisis had just started. August 2007. Credit markets across the world just crashed. And now we're here at the day when gold is hitting out the whole time high. Those two events are not unrelated. They're not unrelated. But the number of people in the room has grown. And you're here with us. And I'd like to extend the invitation to Philip. They did before. Join us. Thank you. But there's a constraint, and I used to chafe against the constraint. I used to not like not getting what I wanted. It was natural, all right? And I, we've watched this. We've seen this. I mean, I, I, this has been a long time coming. All right, a long time coming. And I've been unhappy in the month, so it wasn't this financial event that set me off. And so for decades, I wanted to get out of there. And we're not, we haven't been. And we've met extraordinary people in the interim in the United States that I know was, we were supposed to meet. And God willing, hopefully, we don't have to meet anymore. Yes. yes. Just make um, a point about history, which I think is worth making, that I agree with you about the Chocolate Nicotine Central Banking started in Europe back in the 17th century. But I have to say that uh, with the two world wars in the last century, Britain ended up pretty broke. Uh, Roosevelt and Truman were pretty determined to put an end to the British Empire, probably for good reasons. But I would just like to add that I think the Americans have taken the, uh, the scam to an art form. We took that wonderful goose and we roasted it beyond recognition. <laughs> All right? You perfected the One of my articles, I talked about the British character and the American character. And I said, Brits, you're known for this. <clears throat> the quiet house, the well mannered. Whatever you guys do, I don't know how you guys do it. Fine tailor, you know, it's quiet. This is what you get. We have cowboys in there. <laughs> and when they got a hold of that central bank system, that you guys have nurtured, nurtured, stoked, kept the lid on, the picture didn't go too far, because you knew what you had. You knew what you had. You respected it. And then we got in 1913 went, holy shit, look are we doing this. <laughs> 1913. Ten years later, we started the bubble in 1920s. The biggest speculative bubble in the history of the world. In 1929, it collapsed and set the world into its first Great Depression. You're right. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's no <nowhere> words to do. <laughs> I mean, I told, I told people, I said, you know, we've been buying toasters for $9 a piece. I mean, what the hell? We're living off the hog, but we better start buying more. Let's start stocking up. This thing can last forever. I know that. We, you know, Martha and I, we, we grew up in a time of, of after the, the World War, and it was, a, it was a terrible time. I mean, it was, it was horrible for everybody. And, and we came up with an age that was very, very different. And it was, it was in fact, it was like a bubble we had. We, we truly had a bubble. And at the end, uh, but the, at the beginning of that, it was, it was built on real productivity because everything else had been nailed. It was, it was ground down in dirt. All right? And then when they pulled the gold thing out, in 1971, then really started happening. Then the whole thing started being shaped. Right? Very shaped. And Paul Volcker, paperboy, he was a paperboy. All right. He turned up the ratchet 
took interest rates twenty four percent. Mark and I had uh, I had a company. I went broke. Like that. I had a four hundred thousand dollar line of credit load of luxury goods, and all of a sudden nobody needed it. Right? It was quite unpleasant. But what happened is, is that the miracle of the 1980s came. Right? The miracle of the 1980s. And you know what it was? Oh, it was productivity and all. It was expansion and all. You know what it was? It was big. It was crap. Ronald Reagan came into office, we owed $1 trillion, and eight years later we owed $2.5 trillion. We didn't make that money. We fired. And it went through our veins like heroin goes through a junkie's arteries. And we thought, listen, and now it's over. There it is. Yes. Now, what did you take on how long it might be before the $630 trillion worth of derivatives blows up? You know, that's a curious question. Because we've never been able to. I, yeah, and I look at it, because this question always gets banded up, you know, it's like, how much time do we have? Yeah. And I've noticed two things about it, and neither one has a bearing on the truth. Those of us who see the fissure think it's imminent, all right? There's a gentleman here, you know John Exter, all right? John Exter's a legend, and, and, and Professor knew John Exter. I only knew him by reputation. I found the hint of this guy in my reads. Yes, yes, I found out he had no written, no books. I found a few people who had, one person who had heard him, somebody who had interviewed him, and here, and, and Professor Fekley was the first one who actually knew him, and here's the second person. John Exeter grew up during the Great Depression, went to Harvard in 1938, and decided to find out what happened to the Great Depression. He graduated from Harvard, and he pretty much figured it out. He was a smart guy. And he went to work as a banker, went to work for Citi, and he was a, a, a governor of Fed, and he was a central banker. And he watched what happened. And he said, this is going to end up. This is going to end bad. Started buying gold in the 1960s. All right? This is going to end bad. Deflation. Deflation, deflation, deflation. And he had an argument with Paul Samuelson. And I don't know what Mr. Samuelson. I read some of his articles. He used a lot of math. You know, I don't know mathematical, economic things. I'm bad at math, so I blew up off. Right? But Paul Samuelson had an argument. That with, with John Axter. They're both economists, top ranking economists. This is how cheap Sanders is actually, in my opinion. They had this talk to him. Axter um, felt it was just man down. And they had this dialogue. And at the end, Sanders and goes, Well, you know, John, you may be right. <laughs> but you're lonely. You're what? You're lonely. Pretty cool. John Exeter died in the 1990s. I wrote about him. Somebody sent me his obituary. You know, didn't mention his economic work. And it never happened during his lifetime. That inflation that he said was going to happen. He had bought gold at a time, and his family was much better off for it. But when you see that fissure, when you see that crack, you know how vulnerable it is. And you expect it to happen probably sooner than it's going to. Many of us in this room have been walking around like <laughs> in a state of, <sighs> you know, for a long, a long time. Right? And the ones who don't see the crack are walking around like, man, that's a beautiful day. Yes, 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 and I can turn my car in and get a new one and take an $8,000 credit. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> right? I think it's going to happen somewhere between the two. <laughs> <laughs> The first derivative of your human nature is most people would rather be right, wrong with the crowd than right by themselves. We're afraid. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's what drives them yes. to believe stuff that is completely yeah. unbelievable. Rudy had the evidence. If you're in a crowd, you yeah. believe we, what's unbelievable. We, we do not think. And I don't know if I can speak for the Australians, I can speak for most Americans. We have been. Our media shields us from whatever they don't want us to know. After the 1960s, when the United States went up in flames, the boys at the top decided they didn't want critical The Vietnam War was protesting in the colleges. People got killed. Families broke up. Rage. Intense. Intense. 
And so they decided, let's dumb these parts down. Let's dumb them down. You know, one of the reasons you asked about leaving the United States, one of the reasons Martha and I would like to leave the United States is we found the dialogue a lot better than other people. Not necessarily smart in different countries, but a different background, different point of view. And the one we found in the United States was particularly blind, particularly closed up, particularly blind, and particularly frustrated. Because when you're in a country that was once the greatest country in the world, that had the greatest savings, the world's creditor, and watch it in your lifetime, it wasn't the Russians that did it to us. It wasn't the Chinese that did it to us. It wasn't the British that did it to us. And it wasn't those Mexican immigrants crawling across that river to mow our lawns. Americans, they used to. Yeah? And it scared me. And it works. And, you know, I, I was several. I was several. And uh, I, I've said before that uh, democracy's greatest period came the, during the reign of kings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People just thought, oh man, we get rid of that guy? What? Run ourselves? Oh, we're free. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Alexis de Tocqueville was a French philosopher, nobleman. He came to the United States in the early days of the American experiment. And he said a couple of interesting things. One of them, in, in the 1830s, he said someday, on the world stage, the United States and Russia are going to talk, occupy different opposing sides. 1830! Rasputin even hadn't even made it to the palace! You know? Marx hadn't written his book! Lenin hadn't even been old enough to dream of power! Stop! It was a long way from killing anybody he knew. And he said this. One thing he said. There's another thing that the Tobin said. They came back from America and watched what was happening in our country. He said something I never forgot. He said, America is a flawed experiment. They came back from They want two things. They want to be free. And they want to be loved. And they compromised. They compromised. He said, it matters less to me that I choose my master than that I have. We're done. So some of you guys have been expecting um, a catastrophe for quite quite some time. It hasn't uh, quite happened yet. What are some of the triggers that might provoke it, or are there uh, are there mathematics of, uh, that you can use uh, with world debt and um, real capital and so on to predict how close to the cliff we are? And are there any more tricks? They can pull out of the book. I love it. Yeah. You, know, you, you said exactly what my son said in the 1990s. My son had to put up with it. He was young, went to MIT, went to go with some life, and he had a father that was so enraged and so bitter. I said, there's no hope, this is corrupt, you know? It's only late I realized what I put him through. <laughs> and, and, and he became interested as I ran in the rail about money and who we were up against. And he said, you know, Dad, these guys have all the power. You have no idea what's up their sleeve. You have no idea what's up this Well, there we do know what's up this thing. They pulled basically out. All right. It was the suppression of gold. Gold is a thermometer of the weakness of paper money. They started trying to suppress that soon after they went off the gold standard. 1974, in the IMF announced out of the blue they were selling two million ounces of gold. All right, because gold they were afraid of it moving up. All right? And they sold that when inflation took hold of the United States and, and gold went up to $850. It didn't matter how much gold they had, they couldn't stop the run. All right? That's what happened. So they started doing it then. After 1980, they started doing another one. They started going to the futures market. They started buying. They started manipulating. They went to the bad the central banks. They started losing money because they didn't want this game to end. Why would you? 
if you could go to bed at night richer than you were the day before without having your dad have done this damn thing. But can we know what's going to happen? What's up this week? Yes. I think the metaphor is this. It's a person, let's go back to the, the uh, heroin addict metaphor. In the beginning, the addict doesn't need much. He needs a little fix, a little bit, a little bit. And, but as, he, as, the, as the disease progresses, he needs more and more and more. All right? It doesn't do it. What did it two years ago doesn't even get him out of the shakes this morning. All right? The stimulus that this global economy needs now is so big, they've slammed it a steroid shot. And credit is still contracting. That was Ben Bernanke's bet. That you could liquefy. That was Milton Friedman's bet. Mm. You could pour enough credit into the system and reverse the deflationary contraction. So a depression would never happen. In 1991, at Milton Friedman's birthday party, Ben Bernanke turned to Milton and said, Thanks to you, we will never have another depression. Okay, here we are. They've run out of the tools. They're buying their own debt. They kicked the problem down. What we're encountering right now is the, pro the solution to the last debt crisis that happened. When the dot-com bubble crashed, they slashed interest rates after the stock markets crashed, trying to liquefy the bubble again. They did, and as the professor pointed out in one of his articles, they liquefied it, they turned on the credits, the credit space, but they did not control where it went. He said, we could go on the bond market. Or it could go to this <laughs> And it did. The bubble went up. It burst. People are in shock. They were sold a bill of goods, and they know it. It broke the bond of trust. The, I call it the slow boys and the fast boys. The quick boys are the ones that sell it. They're smart. These guys are smart. They think about this. And if they don't think about it, they hire somebody smarter does. How do you parse this? What's the advantage? How do we get there? The slow boys, they're not fast. They're slow. They're conservative. These are the kind of guys who can approach with a deal that I sit there. Right? But in the great game, the fast boys pulled it over on the slow boys. Triple A. Triple A. Mm, <laughs> you know, my first thing about the crash is they had in Australia. They were sitting in the United States, and I'm reading about your townships. Your municipalities that bought triple A bonds from Wall Street, and you guys were in trouble. That's the first thing that I found out. Wow, really is. People just trying to put their savings in place, put it in a safe place. That game called capitalism forces you to bet. And it forces you to bet on the table that you're a chump. Somebody wrote me about my little use of cavities. He runs one of the gold sites, I mean, it's a one. And I said, I've got nothing against free markets. I love free markets. I don't think they should be left in their own. It's like, like and if I had any, what told me from us, like Ted Bunny went, I don't think we ought to have police. <laughs> you know? It's an imposition on, our, on what we want to do, on free will. You know? There were people who would argue that slavery was an affront to free trade. So let's be a little circumspect about where we draw the lines, and if we need it or not. But what happened is that these people got into power, and the savers, the closer you are to the space of credit, the closer you are to power, the more you benefit from their system. You are forced to beg your savings on their table. You're forced to. If it was money, you could put it aside and spend it. But it's paper that they print, and they print more of it every year, and that paper gets less, worth less and less, and you stick it under your bed, you give it to your kid, it, you buy less tomorrow than it does today. So you're forced to take your savings and bet. With who? With them. With them. Them. They took the pension funds of the teachers, the firemen, the, the workers, and they bet on Wall Street, and they lost. The next crisis is when they're going to look for those pensions. 
Mm. That's what they're saying. They're out there. Those assets are gone. Now, when they have to pay out, they're going to find out. But the banks are allowed to keep those crap assets on their, on their books at full value. Yeah. All right? Let's not talk about freedom. It be spurts the name. It be spurts the name. Talking about a monetary system without gold is like talking about religion without God. Any other questions? <laughs> Another question, just a statement. You said the um, said the core of the American character is the cowboy. I'd say suggest that maybe the core of the Australian character is the convict. <laughs> I don't know what it means. Maybe we can think about it. And what that means is how we will react as Australians to this. In a disorderly society, or in a society where order is imposed by those who benefit from the order that they have instated, we instated. It may be the convicts that say free. Mm. That's why we're here. No accident. Thank you.